Welcome everyone, this is Denny and Carl with Get Wisdom and today we're going to continue with the channeling series. We're going into, I think we're starting our third year now and today's topic is, uh, today's subject is Cecil Rhodes who many will recognize as maybe one of the uh, founders of uh, geopolitical machinations that are that are still with us today. He he is the uh, the namesake for the uh, the Rhodes Scholarship from uh, I believe it's Oxford University. So you will have seen an introduction about Cecil Rhodes uh, prior to uh, Carl and I starting here. So we have six questions for him today, and with that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, invite you, Carl, to 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 tell us a little bit about what you do as a channeler. And anything else that you might like to talk about uh, in terms of Cecil Rhodes and the cabal and you know the uh, the secret powers of of uh, geopolitical forces operating on Earth, you know, because I know you know you know a little bit about it. Well, I do and I don't. <laughs> I I know there's a cabal. I know there is a, a dark underbelly of human civilization due to the corruption from the extraterrestrial involvement <clears throat> that has been going on since almost the very beginning of humanity. And certainly historically, the timeline is, is such that this is very, very much the case. So we live with extraterrestrials and there is a large cohort of extraterrestrial bloodline members from interbreeding with the Anunnaki who were the principal extraterrestrials interfering with humanity and now there's a whole alliance of several alien races the Anunnaki being the first and most central and the interbreeding has resulted in these hybrid beings who are part of the power structure. So they do have a somewhat favored status. I know there is a plan for them to continue on and continue to be supported. I don't know how sincere that is. I don't know how genuine it might be, but that is the current uh, story in any event. But these are the power brokers. These are the hidden hand that tell the politicians what to do, including the world leaders. They control the money. They control the circle of billionaires that end up with large amounts of money in various uh, ways. And so there is a network of this power structure that interacts with the extraterrestrial community and thereby controls humanity indirectly. This is how the aliens operate. They use humans as an overlay, as administrators, and is sort of a police force to ride herd on things and also to create mischief when they choose to do so. Right. They get humans to cause problems and then they rush in and and help indirectly through their other minions and it keeps a kind of a circus going. It's like a three-ring circus right. of all these different things going all over the world. We have these pockets of deep poverty and suffering. We have the the affluent areas. We have the areas in turmoil from all kinds of strife, the cultural wars, the racial wars, and the gender wars now. We've got almost any kind of hot button right. they can press. They'll it's start like, it up. It's just like the divide and conquer thing just being repeated and repeated in any yeah. area of interest that you could think of. Factions, right. human factions are created to battle each other. You know. Well, it, and 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 the thing about it is all of it needs money at some point in some way. Yeah. And part of the agenda is to drain money away from those societies that are fairly functional to try to worsen them. So this kind of downward trajectory 
in the West from having peaked a while back and now with costs of living and so on and the complexities of life and how it's been structured to be and what's valued, it's distorted things in a way that people can barely make a living and raise a family, both. You can still make a living in many of the Western countries okay, you know, assuming you're, you have normal capabilities. But try and raise a family with children, you know, on a single salary, which used to be typical. Right. It, it can't really be done well now. So yeah. now you have two parents working. Daycare is a real issue, whether you can get quality daycare and raise kids. And there's many compromises. And, and it all goes back to money. Mm-hmm. So the people through this period of history who were involved with financial doings and the creation of stores of wealth or sources of wealth are the first place one might look to see links to this hidden hand, this, right. this deep state, whatever you want to call it, the cabal, yeah. the Illuminati is a term that's uh, been around for a long time also, the secret societies and their links to something very mysterious and presumed to be dark um, is not just an idle notion. It's not right. just some kind of fictitious conspiracy theory. There are many connections of that kind that right. interconnect this intermediate population of really agents of the cabal. Because that's really who they are. Yeah, and agents and, of the D, of the uh, ET alliance, you know, the dark alien alien agenda yeah. is being played out through them. They have their operators. They don't. The ETs themselves don't really have to do anything because they can manipulate the humans into doing this. And they have time, and they have the perspective of long periods of times that humans don't have. Cecil Rhodes didn't even make it to fifty years old, but yet his influence is still felt to this day. And I imagine. You know, that, that what he was able to accomplish in his short life is, is, is going to be revealed as time goes on when people get a more accurate view of what, of what, what actually happened historically. You know, and the, and the disinformation around uh, World War I, which we're going to discuss in the questions today, um, you know, it's right, it's, right, you know, it's right in his lap, that whole thing. And it, and it was a money undertaking. And a secret society uh, methodology that was used with all the governments there, and the uh, uh, the use of war as a tool to maintain uh, financial uh, uh, pre- preeminence, you know, in the on a worldwide basis. So, this, the World War One was considered the first modern day worldwide war. It was called World War, World War One, the war to end all wars, and it was a global phenomenon. And it set the stage in very many ways uh, for World War II, which was even bigger in some respects. Um, so, and Cecil Rhodes is right at the heart of this. And there's uh, you know new books being written about uh, that whole that whole era. And one of the ones I just I just laid my hands on here is uh, it's called The Hidden History, and uh, and here's uh, Cecil Rhodes' successor right here. A fellow by the name of uh, Alfred Milner, who headed up the secret society that Cecil Rhodes formed uh, back at the turn of the century, and um, basically they set the stage and uh, promulgated World War One, uh, which you know changed the whole fabric of the European continent and what happened in in the years following, which set the stage for Nazi Germany's rise to power and uh, it's a fascinating story but it's it the but the real story the apparent apparently the real story is very different from what someone's going to learn as a history major in college well i can't really speak to that i'm not a historian or really a scholar of these individuals at all um i know the marist outlines you're describing at, at best. Um, so we'll, we'll see what they can do to illuminate things. Yeah. Okay. I know the arms industry 
is universally recognized as a kind of force in society. But of course, it's viewed as a necessity that there's going to be human evil that's taken as a given. There's going to be war. There always has been war. There will always be wars. This is taken as a given. So we need more and better arms. And, and that only makes it easier to go to war. And then you've got to replace all of that ammunition and all the material that gets right. destroyed and so on. <clears throat> but we, we somehow never beat our swords into plowshares, so to speak. The money goes one way. And it never comes back into the general society so much. It, it, it's going somewhere. It's enriching many people. But it's, it's being used for a worsening of yeah, things. Yeah, right. And, and there's... A, it's, and not there's an end, thing, it's not an end in and of itself. It's a tool for power. Yes. You know? So the, the greed theory really falls flat on its face if you look at it. The, 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 the money is, is being used as a tool for power and control. Um, yes. The money in, in and of itself is not the goal. People getting rich is not the goal. Yeah, and, and it really is a propaganda campaign to make military endeavors a heroic operation mm -hmm. in service to, used to be God, but now it's mom and apple pie more so, more right. a secular view, survival of one's yeah, stealth or our the country, state, our way of life, yeah. and this sort of thing. Yeah, and it's a it's turned into a euphemism, you know, for for, for yeah. you know, I went to serve my country. Well, what does that mean? The government, <laughs> you know, yeah. the infrastructure, the borders, you know. So it's we don't really need to define our terms, but but you're right. There's a lot of effort being put into uh, surrounding all of those notions with 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 as an honorable thing. But, you know, killing, there's really nothing honorable about killing, and that's what war is. And that's what militaries are about, war. So, um, yep. so I have six questions. Um, we'll, you know, we should hopefully get some, some, uh, some light shed on, on all of this. Um, he was a pivotal figure, as, as was some of the other people that we've done uh, channelings on. And um, not widely known. You know, I think, I think. Probably most people are somewhat familiar with the Rhodes Scholarships, but maybe beyond that, they don't, they've never really heard of this guy. Well, that's me included. And, you know, I, he, he popped up yesterday on my <laughs> radar when you sent me the questions to channel this person. So, yeah. so this, this is, we're all in this together. Those of us who are um, uninformed, so we'll we'll see what uh, what happens here. Okay. Okay. All right. So I will reach out to connect with him in the light. His soul is still up there, and we can talk with him. Courtesy of Creator of all it is, I do my channeling through Creator for reasons of security and safety. <clears throat> it's a difficult thing to connect with beings in that high vibration and it's it's a special thing and in a sense it's sort of piercing the veil in a way that is not customary so it is a special event and it's done with many rules attached to it on their end we always do things through ignorance and wanting to accomplish something, hoping we'll do some good. That's where we're coming from. Those are our motivations. Yeah. But the divine realm sees the bigger picture better than we do. And, and so they will only allow certain information to come through. What's really highest and best for us to know, some things that might be deeply troubling, they'll filter out. Or that we haven't developed... A foundation to appreciate they will not share those because then that will lead us in a new direction perhaps and they're not allowed to do that 
we're supposed to make our way in life. We can get support and help, but they won't lead us. They won't direct us. They won't tell us where to go next. They'll answer specific questions in specific ways, but usually with a kind of a narrow confine to give us sort of a bare minimum and and not um, open up a new avenue, a new way of thinking. If we do get that, we're very lucky. And it's really because we have prepared ourselves sufficiently that it's the next thing that we're going to think of. And they'll maybe give us a little encouragement in that direction by rewarding us. But we never know what will happen. And uh, it, it's uh, I'm always uncomfortable in these particular channelings where I really have little background myself personally because I don't want to be the choke point, but it is what it is. So yeah. we'll, we'll see. We're certainly wanting yeah. to have a, a wider discussion about this history and right. it is in its consequences and the implications for us in particular. Yeah. And the same goes for me too. Like I, you know, generally I'm, uh, you know, I only have a few days uh, that I can devote to research to come up with, you know, questions that are going to be interesting for the for uh, for the viewers, for us, for the light beings themselves, and the kinds of things they like to talk about. And without fail, you know, for every one of these, I probably missed several questions that have been that it could have been really helpful in any one of those areas. So we're just doing the best we can. You know, uh, hopefully, maybe someday we'll we'll be at a place where we could go back and maybe revisit some of these. Um, some of these beings, these light beings, and ask them better, more insightful questions because it's something that we've learned, you know, since our first go round with them. So, um, yeah, there's no perfection here. There's no, um, you know, we're not we're not uncovering a whole series of silver bullets or anything like that. Um, but I think, by and large, over the last two years, we have been. Um, fleshing out a, a view of things it's been very helpful especially when it comes to um, understanding the problem and uh, and and understanding what we can do about the problem and why it's so important yeah well and and that is uh, that is the motivation here because this is a serious undertaking for serious reasons it's not just to satisfy curiosity about something even extraordinary that yeah. could change history and change our culture. We're interested in human betterment, but also human survival. And there's real hazards right now facing us squarely. And the more we can learn what we're dealing with and get divine help with it, and the more we can awaken others, the likelier it will be that we get sufficient divine help to do what's needed. Okay. And it's on our shoulders. So if you watching don't like what we're doing and how we're going about it, give us suggestions. <laughs> give us the benefit of your wisdom. Yeah. If you see an angle we're not addressing that could be very productive in your view, send us an email. Tell us why. And, you know, we may well adopt your idea. This is how I do lots of my research. It's built on the ideas of others and the groundwork that's been laid by many others through time in their own fashion, from their own perspectives. And I'll see some potential there that maybe they weren't privy to the information to formulate the same projection. And then I'll take what they did and then extend it because I know more about a certain aspect that they were blind to. And this is how it gets done. This is how all of human thought and logic and the scientific enterprise, this process of discovery and exploration really comes about. And it's the way it's supposed to be a human enterprise done right. by humans for high purpose and with divine partnership. And that is the best uh, we can do and it's it's really a wonderful thing when we get everything running and, and you know uninhibited 
uninhibited, unhindered, unconstrained, and have the divine as a component in there, because that'll give us greater fuel to work with and greater insight and support along the way. <clears throat> That's why they call it inspiration. It's when you're in spirit, connection and awareness that you can transcend your own limitations, at least for a time, and come up with a new idea that may be the first ever by a human being. So there are also many ideas people have and don't know what to do with. They don't have connections. They don't have other pieces of the puzzle, but they may be privy to a certain thing. And that might be a puzzle piece that I could use to round something out. So, yeah. so that's what we're after here with this dialogue. And we will be going back and talking with some of the individuals we've spoken with previously. And it's, it's ideal when you can do it. It's always the time limitation. Yes. Yeah. The rub. Right. But okay. you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what we get. And, okay. and I, I'm sure it'll be a new foundation that we're building that will lead to something else. Yeah, I think okay. so. I agree with that. So, so I will reach out and set up the state of consciousness I need to make the connection and put safety around the work. Very important. And uh, he, he will announce his presence when he's on board. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> this is Cecil Rhodes speaking. Thank you for joining us. Were you killed and replaced by reptilian and was your transition successful? What were the circumstances for the same regarding your apparent successor, Alfred Milner? This is an insightful question and an astute perception because this was in fact what befell me. I was in a line of fire, in fact, becoming involved in sources of revenue of great significance. And this made me an obstacle to the needs of the deep state, the cabal, as you have described it, both are useful terms for the hidden power structure that controls the flow of money and the funding for all governmental and particularly military and intelligence operations that manipulate geopolitics. I was replaced and this was a consequence of the need for power and control. It is done when there is strategic value to manipulate someone who can be a gatekeeper and a tool to orchestrate a consolidation of resources in a precise fashion to allow control over the destiny of the fortune involved. This is done with respect to those with political leadership, but also those important to the financial community and the flow of money into the hands of the dark forces. So that befell me and was also true for my predecessor as well. It is not uncommon for those holding the reins of power, not even at the highest level, but who are, in a sense, the functional control point in the power institutions may well be 
an alien imposter for reasons of security and having a powerful control of things so they can push back if politics intrude and threaten the organization and the flow of funding in the desired direction. The idea of politics is necessary, but in the human sphere, for the most part, is divorced, divorced from morality and the morality of a divine perspective. This creates many potential confounding factors, some of which are organized to happen as a distraction, but others can arise because of the lack of moral authorship and participation in the establishment of rules and the controls. And so in the general chaos, it must be dealt with by both sides, both the human and the extraterrestrial power structure orchestrated from a position of hiding, essentially, and that will allow things to keep going. The cost is quite large in human terms as it cost us our very lives. Okay, thank you. In Carol Quigley's book, Tragedy and Hope, he states that you were inspired by Oxford's John Ruskin, where he promoted the spread of England's magnificent vision of education, beauty, rule of law, freedom, decency, and self-discipline self to the world. In your last will and testament, you wrote, I contend that we are the first race in the world and that the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race. I contend that every acre added to our territory means the birth of more of the English race who otherwise would not be brought into an existence. Was this your understanding of Ruskin's vision? How did these goals include the idea of war? Or were you or your successors' goals changed? And if so, how did this happen? This indeed is a contamination of thinking through a direct manipulation. In the replacement with a reptilian shape-shifting imposter, the meaning then is all bets are off, so to speak, as to what might happen. In actuality, this is done in a way to provide a seamless transition where there may be a shift in thinking that develops slowly, but will end up in full alignment with benefits for the hidden, the hidden hand and not for humanity on a large scale. This is the consequence of ideas that become contaminated with a sort of poison doctrine fostered by the extraterrestrial cabal. And then when embraced by humans in a position of leadership taints things and begins a process of further and further corruption of thinking. In the case of the British hierarchy and the provincialism, the, the view of the supremacy, their culture and way of life, represented in their thinking became magnified and distorted to be an entitlement and a license to manipulate others and to 
even suppress them and drain them of capital and the fruit of their own labor in service to the British Empire. This is faulty on many, many levels and is instituted with direct involvement of mind control manipulation. Those reptilian imposters in positions of authority receive their marching orders as well, psychically. They are told what to do and when to do it in a kind of masterminded plan of conquest and ongoing control and manipulation. The average person, including those in the hierarchy of power, are influenced by all of the cultural beliefs and mind control manipulation as well that reinforces the entitlement in this case and the blind eye in seeing the consequences of the manipulation and subjugation of other nations and territories at the cost of the native peoples who by virtue of their historical presence should have autonomy and the governance of their own land. When this is taken away in service to a nation with more muscle and a kind of evil resolve to serve the self, this is a crime. It is a crime against humanity and it is a crime against divinity as well. It is non-divine to take from others what does not belong to the self. There must be a give and take in all exchanges. It needs to be agreed to. It needs to be voluntary. And it needs to be done with an openness so people are not manipulated into surrendering something of great value that is appreciated by one party that is essentially duping the other and then extracting future wealth and prosperity in service to selfish needs. All of this is a kind of evil and designed to diminish humans and their reach and their own security and safety. This happens again and again. It just migrates around the world, visiting varied regions, each in turn, to overturn things, create turmoil, and replace it with an infrastructure designed to make people complacent and accept an oversight as the next best thing to societal chaos. So when a powerful country comes in with troops to restore order or establish order, they may well be welcomed, but then the fox is in the hen house, so to speak, and things will not go well for that nation ever. Humans were not made to be imprisoned. And this minding of other countries by the real or implied threat of military force is only setting up a kind of prison 
It is a prison of the mind as well as the body. And the former is a greater error and a greater manipulation and worsening of things. This causes multiple generations of negative karmic consequences. When people are conquered and subjugated and denied their sovereignty, it is a wounding that will play out for generations into the future in a worsening of things personally as well as on a societal level. The wounds will worsen, they will re-echo, they will be, in a sense, still bleeding, capable of becoming infected, and may well erupt, bursting on the scene with breakdowns and with much chaos through negative conduct and poor performance to maintain useful working environments and a cooperativity to have harmony in the very fabric of society, to have commercial enterprises and forms of commerce being served and keeping things supplied that are needed for maintenance of life itself. When society breaks down, all suffer. And who wins is only the alien overseers seeking human suffering as an exercise of their own depravity. My name and personhood was used in service to this dark presence. And that is the major lesson of trusting people in power, particularly when there are large amounts of money to be made through the exploitation of human labor or the exploitation of natural resources, particularly those with concentrated value, as in the precious metals and diamond industries. The surest way to funnel money away from human hands is to deem things of great value you then take away the yearning for them once again, the need from the very fabric of societal structure built around those concepts makes it so that those who control the money control the world. It has always been thus, except when humans were living solely as divine beings with a divine awareness and a true give and take on an ongoing basis with the Almighty. The state of disconnection from that higher awareness has allowed this evil to creep in and they have made the most of it. This is the dark legacy of my era and what it has continued to inspire and spread around the world. Okay, thank you. What was and perhaps still is the significance and purpose of the Rhodes Scholarships? <laughs> 